Michael, you're the practitioner of the trade because you're actually one of, <laughs> yeah, one of the practitioners of the trade. And uh, so we're just kind of wondering, what are you seeing uh, in the markets for your middle market and also the creativity that it's everybody needs to be creative because there's competition. There's a lot of money chasing everything. So how are you dealing with it and finding good investments? Yes, thanks. So a couple of comments. Um, you know, I, I think our strategy is is a bit unique because uh, we have a a platform that is providing capital to mostly middle market buyout funds across equity and credit, and we have a relatively straightforward approach to secondaries, which involves utilizing our closest relationships that we've developed over a three decade period to get really interesting access to deal flow in what we think are less competitive processes. And the secondary market has evolved to include a number of capital market tools, a number of transaction technologies, which are difficult to explain probably in the brief amount of time that we have in total here. But our strategy seem has been to focus on a uh, a bit of a, 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 a basic approach to, to finding very high quality businesses with excellent alignment, whose investors, LPs, want or need liquidity. And so I would characterize our approach as, as being relatively vanilla, which in my opinion, and in our opinion, in the market environment that we're in today is, is a good one. Because rates have uh, gone up dramatically, as we all know, and that puts pressure on certain investment styles that require leverage to enhance or generate a, an acceptable return. We've never done that. We don't need that. Um, we also have been, you know, relatively, I, I think, risk averse relative to some of the more exotic betas uh, around venture capital that has um, obviously a lot of beta, but you know, quite, quite a bit of potential downside if, if those investments you know, don't work out uh, quite as planned. And so we have a strategy that is relatively straightforward, which actually has many, in many ways become novel because the secondary market has become so sophisticated in utilizing different transaction technologies and various capital markets tools. And that's not an incrimination of those tools or those deal types. Uh, it, it's just, I'm explaining our approach. The state of innovation today for secondaries, however, between different transaction structures, and, and I don't know if the audience would benefit from a little bit of a conversation on what an LP and a GP secondary is. Um, you know, I, I cover both, so may, maybe I'll cover LP and then Roche, if you want to cover GP, uh, we could we could sort of ham and egg it, as they say in show business. Um, but you know, an LP transaction is done. We we Michelle touched on elements of this. An LP transaction is done for a number of reasons, and it can be because the endowment or the foundation has been in the fund for twelve years, and they said, "Geez, I thought this would be wrapped up in ten, and I'm still in this fund. And can I can I get out of this thing?" Well, if you go back fifteen or twenty years, it was the norm to patiently wait until you received your last distribution and your final K-1. And, and, and the secondaries market was much smaller at that time. And if you fast forward to today, you have pensions and endowments and CIOs that are saying, well, there's a liquid market for these funds. And we've considered pivoting from this side of the room to that side of the room. So why don't we sell that side of the room and then start buying more of that side of the room? And so an LP secondary is a transaction that facilitates that liquidity gathering that it, for that investor that wants or needs it. And it's done by buying out the interest and stepping into that investor's shoes. And there are a variety of very interesting transaction technologies around tr deferrals, um, you know, risk sharing models, synthetic secondaries that have been done. But the, but the base level of it is, I'm taking over your partnership interest. If there's upside to this, I own it. If there's downside to this, I own it. And that is, as Michelle says, about 50% of the secondary market. It's, it's the roots of the conventional secondary market that helps limited partners get liquidity ahead of the final, 
the final K1 that comes in the door. It's diversified. You often get a little discount on it or a meaningful discount. We like to say that price is what you pay and quality is what you get, however. So you know, be wary of transactions that are pricing at a very steep discount because the market is reasonably efficient. Um, and you get backward diversification. Uh, you get a more, a more rapid path to uh, getting your capital back on a, you know, on a DPI basis or a distribution of paid-in basis. So there's, there's good base roots to that. And, and all that activity that we had with general partners uh, you know, buying their LP interests led to a natural evolution and conversation with GPs around, well, what, you know, what, what other types of liquidity solutions do you have on the other side of your suit? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull on a thread that you just started sewing for me here, which is what is a secondary, right? It's liquidity in an otherwise illiquid market. Private equity does not have daily, monthly, quarterly, annual, biannual liquidity. It does not exist in this market other than when assets are sold. The solve for that is us. It's the people that you see on this stage. This is what we do. We create liquidity in an otherwise illiquid market. And so the start of it was that, LP secondaries and folks that had uh, entered into a marriage that they thought was going to be 10 years, that became 12, that became 15, or folks that entered into a 10-year marriage and realized after five years, I suppose as the average American does, that uh, it's time for divorce. Uh, and so they needed to create liquidity here. And so that that was the sort of evolution of the LP market. And I think what, what we see driving volume, both LP and GP, to just pull this thread further, is that this dearth of liquidity that exists in private markets is, is driving a lot of deal flow. And it's part of the reason that as I sort of made that tongue-in-cheek joke about golden age of secondaries, it's the golden age of secondary is because LPs need to sell. Um, distributions, and, and we've got data to bear this out, distributions in the market are down 60 to 70% off a of peak in a normal year. 2022 was the first cash flow negative year in private equity in 15 years. 2023 is going to be the second cash flow negative year in private equity in 16 years. That's tough for Can limited partners. Can you define cash flow negative? Yeah, L LPs are contributing more to their funds than they're receiving in distributions right now. And so... Uh, that, that's because it's not that they're not that NAVs are going down. It's not that you have a negative return in the industry. I'm not suggesting that. But on a bank account basis, you are net out money in private equity likely this year with a mature program. And so that's creating an imperative for, for liquidity in secondaries. And that's driving a lot of LP volume, which which you might just covered. Um, and then on the GP led side, this is sort of the, the new technology that's come to exist in secondaries, uh, really actually in response to this. And so it's not really just in response to 2022 and 2023. But if we go back to the COVID era in 2020, uh, we all know this, it, you know, it seems like a day and a decade ago, but the world came to a halt in the first half of 2020, uh, not just for all of us in our personal lives, not just for us in commuting to work, but there was no exit activity happening in the first half of 2020. And, and we didn't know when it was going to happen again. You know, I think we can all think back to March of 2020 and laughing and saying, okay, we'll see you in July. We didn't see anybody in July. Uh, and so this dearth of liquidity that existed and private equity facilitated the need for this GP-led market. Uh, banks pulled back, right? You know, big syndicated lenders pulled back from loaning to large private equity businesses. The direct lending funds, so these are captive sort of private equity-like funds, slowed down in their ability to lend. Doing a change of control transaction became tough. IPOing became impossible. Strategics got tight on cash. So your sort of three classic exit windows became very challenging for private equity. And so sponsors looked around and they go, well, if I can't sell my business to somebody else, how do I sell it to myself, right? How do I sell this to myself and create liquidity for my LPs? And so the answer to that was let's create this GP-led, this continuation vehicle market that exists right now. And the core of that market is you go out and you find secondary buyers like me, like Mike, like Tom, the people sitting here on the stage. Uh, and you say, will you capitalize a vehicle to acquire this company? And our answer is, sure, at a price and at a reasonable set of terms. If you roll all of your carried interest, you roll all of your GP commit, we get really good alignment. So if I win, you win, right? And I, you have to, in order for you to keep winning, I have to win here too. But we sort of negotiate all those terms. And you know what the beauty is? Most of these are not true change of control transactions. And so sponsors get the opportunity to port an existing capital structure, re-up with their bank or their lender if they have to, but an easier conversation with an existing lending source. Um, and they can use that transaction then to solve their core problem with their LPs, right? Because what is private equity? You know, the joke might be it's an investing business. I might tell you on the stage it's a capital raising business at the end of the day. So what is private equity? It's a capital raising business. Uh, if our investment returns look good, we haven't given you money in your bank account, you're not going to invest in our next fund. And so how do we solve that? When we can't sell business to anybody else, we sell them to ourselves and we create liquidity for you, our limited partners. And so 
That market has grown very quickly over the last three years. Prior to that, there was a GP-led market. Uh, it stunk. Uh, most of the deals that existed in the GP-led market to that were not great assets with great sponsors that had a liquidity problem. These were zombie 10, 12-year-old funds that had not generated carry. Uh, and their partners coming to you and saying, I promise this time will be different. Capitalize this fund, take out my LPs. I promise to you this time will be different. Pay me some fees and carry. Um, those deals worked okay by and large, but were not great. This market has now become best sponsors, best assets, best alignment to solve this liquidity problem. And then the best part of it from my perspective is I think there's a long-term secular change in secondaries right now. These are higher returning deals than the LP side of the market. We're taking more concentrated risk, more duration. They have to be higher returning from a pure finance perspective, uh, but they're higher returning deals. But sponsors have grown to love them too. Super tax efficient. You roll all your carry into a vehicle. You don't pay taxes on it. And by the way, you pay cap gains on carry. I think as everybody in this room knows anyways, super tax efficient. In a normal world, these sponsors would have sold these assets to their competitors or strategic. They would not have gotten the ups on them. There was no go on management fee and carry for them. And so not only is it good for their personal checkbooks, it's good for the firms because they keep generating management fees and carry. It's good for their management teams to keep working with them, their best companies, their best management teams, great alignment, their own reinvestment. Them. I think it's, it's really compelling. And so there's this long term secular change in secondaries where sponsors, even in a better liquidity environment, are going to want to do this. They have an economic motivation to continue to do this. Um, and we think that that drives better long-term returns.